Yeah, Father, we just love you this morning. We adore you this morning. We are so grateful for you this morning. And Father, I just pray for every person listening to this message, for every heart that is open to receive from your truth today. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will come and you will just really reach down deep and pull out that's not from you. And Father, transform every heart, every mind, every soul that's listening to this message, message today. I bless every person, Father God, with your name. I thank you that your goodness shines upon their lives every second of their day. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will teach us how to see that goodness in every second of our day. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, for your faithfulness towards us, this family, this house. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So just an update, I don't know if you guys have done it. For those of you who don't know, we have two, um, two of our members or close family members that is in hospital at this moment. The one is Almy. I went to see her on Friday. <clears throat> she's doing okay. <laughs> she's got a lot of pain, but the doctors are very happy with the operation and what I want everything in regards with her leg. But I want to encourage you guys to please keep on praying. She has a lot of pain. Um, we did take communion together, and we're trusting the Lord that the communion will help her to just um, take her mind off the pain. But we're also trusting the Lord for quick recovery, and so far it seems like that is happening. The doc doctors are coming back with good reports, and we're trusting the Lord for a full restoration that she will be dancing with us very soon. With regards to Patrick, um, there were some complications that pop up a little bit later last week. But we're still chatting to them, and we're trusting that everything that is, they're stuck in Durban, so you guys can pray for them to come back home. Um, that is the main, main reason. So just to keep you guys in the loop, please keep them in their prayers. They're part of this foundation of this church, um, and we need them healthy and whole, just for themselves and their families, but also to come and serve the way that God intended them to serve in this church. So yeah, that is Almi and Bernard, and Patrick and Tracy. Um, we love them, and we hope truly that they will be joining us, not next week, that's too soon, but maybe in two weeks' time, they will be here. Okay, so this morning, I want you guys to open your Bibles with me to uh, Matthew 13. I was asking the Lord, what is the title of my sermon? And there was kingdom, gospel, goodness, <laughs> and I'm like, so it's one of those, whatever the message means to you. That is the title of the message. But the main thing for me this morning is I want to show you today the absolute favor that we have on our lives because of God that is in love with us. It's one of my favorite messages. Like I just can't get away from it. The moment I want to move away to a different you know, topic or whatever, I just come back to this. We have a God that's in love with us. And not a God, the God, the only true God the one that created heavens and earth, he's in love with us. And so easily what religion does, religion tells us you, you're not worthy of this love. You're not worthy of what he wants to pour out in your life. We think the cross and the crucifixion was almost like, oh goodness, these sinners, let me just go save them. And then he just went on with his ways. That's not true. He literally became a sacrifice for you. Now, if I just think one of my love languages is time, that's just one of my love languages. I've got a very unhealthy um, relationship sometimes with time. I um, always have to be on time, which I wasn't this morning, but anyway. But if someone sacrifices their time for me, it really touches my heart. It really shows me, wow, you value who I am. You value the way that I communicate that is incredible. So if someone sacrifices that, my husband's love language is touch. So whenever I sacrifice my busy mom duties to sit next to Stoffel and just rub his back, he feels loved. And to him, it's a gift that I'm giving towards him. It's something that he can appreciate and love and adore. Now, if you take that and you put it in the form of what Jesus has done for us on the cross, God sacrificed his son it's not, you know, I get so angry or frustrated or whenever, whenever we put Christianity 
in the religious box. I'm like, no, dudes, it's not even comparable. You can't compare Christianity with Hinduism. It's not comparable. Religion, yes, but not Christianity, not sonship. You can't compare. We can't just go from one day to the next and do the Christian religious thing and think that is the difference. What makes it the difference and what makes it completely different, the truth is the fact that it's the Spirit of God that lives inside of us. We are one with the Spirit of God. And that came from a sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He's amazing. I, I get lost in that. I get lost in that whole vibe of, oh my word, it was the perfect God that became sin. I get lost in it. I can go and stay in that space about what it looks like, what's the impact, what's the implications for hours at a day. It energizes me. And all it keeps on bringing me, it keeps on bringing me back to his feet where I'm like, Lord, you are so good. The goodness of God must be the most important foundation in your life. You need to get that. The goodness of God. Chase it down. Find it. Just see it. The goodness of God, that is, that is who he is. He is good. He is the definition of good. He is the existence of good. He is the truth of good. Nothing else is close to resembling how good he is. It's not even comparable. Love, I'm getting stuck here the whole time. Will you go my? I don't know what I'm doing, but I dance here on the other. I need to make a towel longer, Mark. But I'm not sure what you did. Thank you. That's say. That's say. Thank you. Okay. So I want you to go with me to Matthew 13, verse 44 to 46. Now, this whole parable is. Um, Jesus speaking to his disciples. This is after Jesus spoke to the multitude and they went into the house and then his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the, um, the tares of the field. So that is what's basically happening, Matthew. I'm reading Matthew, Matthew 36. So this is the parable that Jesus is speaking to his um, disciples. And he says here in 44, the heading in the New King James Version says, the parable of the hidden treasure. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it, he goes and sells that all, all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking a beautiful, beautiful pearl, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold, sold all that he had and, brought, and bought it. So we see two parables where Jesus is referring to what is the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven is a man that saw a treasure, found a field, saw this treasure, sold everything to buy the field so he can get the treasure. A merchant that went on the seas, saw the beautiful pearl, sold everything that he can buy this perfect, beautiful pearl. Now for a very long time, religion tells you that's what your life should be for the kingdom of heaven. You must sold everything. You must gave up everything so that you can buy the perfect gift, which is Jesus Christ. Now, what is religion? Religion tells you that you must do, 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 so that you can get. Where sonship says, you have, because I gave. The truth about these two parables is that the treasure and the pearl is you. That the treasure, the guy that went, go, goes out and buys the field is Jesus. And the great merchant, and we know that in Proverbs 31, if you go read about it, the great merchant is Jesus. Twice he says the kingdom of heaven, this is an understanding, a principle that we need to get. The kingdom of heaven is Jesus going out, giving everything, selling everything. Think about it. Jesus didn't get murdered by human race. The Romans or the Jews didn't kill him. He laid down his life. He gave up the glory of who he is in exchange to become flesh and blood like us so that he can understand exactly that he can do the sacrifice exactly for what humans are going through. He gave up the king, the glory, the beauty. He gave it up and he became man like you and me. And then he laid down his life. And John, it says, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down. And when the Spirit of God resurrected him, you were resurrected. 
you will lie down with him and you were resurrected with him. It's a very funny biology in heaven, but that's the way it works. <laughs> I tried to ask Jesus one day to explain it to me, but I'm not good in biology, so it went missing in my mind. I want to take you to another scripture that this morning when I read it, I had tears, tears in my eyes. It's Isaiah 43, verse 4, but I'm going to read it to you today out of the Passion Translations version of Isaiah. It's out. I found it. I'm looking now for the Bible, the Message Bible. That's my next buy. Come on, crack up 43. So, I'm going to read it to you in Isaiah 43 out of the Passion Translation. Verse 4. Since you are cherished, cherished and precious in my eyes, and because I love you dearly and want to honor you, I willingly give up nations in exchange for you, a man to save your life. Isn't that, if you read it in the New King James Version, it says, since you are precious in my sight, I have been honored I have been honored. That's God speaking about you. I have been honored. I have been honored, and I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and a people for your life. What is he referring to? He's referring to the cross. Because you are dearly loved, because you are so precious in my sight, because I'm honored to walk with you, I'm going to give my son. For you. I'm going to sell everything. I'm going to give up everything for you. Now that brings tears to my eyes. You see, when you start to think about that, when you start to realize, my goodness, I am loved. My goodness, I am, I am loved. It's not an idea. It is not an ideology. It's not some kind of principle. It's the absolute truth that God of the universe is in love with you. And the whole gospel, everything about the gospel, the story of the, of the gospel is the greatest love story that you'll ever see. It's the greatest love story. And I find myself that so easily every day I forget about that love story. So easily every day I move my heart, my intimacy away from this bridegroom that's in love with his bride, and I just take my eyes off and I look at something else, and I allow that thing to become my narrative. And I allow that thing to become my truth. Where Jesus is like, just look at me, my darling, my perfect bride. Look at me, my darling, my perfect bride. Because in the moment your eyes meet his eyes, you are transformed. It's not a, it's not a work. It is a rest. I said to Stoffel, and this is a journey that both of us has been, we've been on, I don't know, I'm going to switch over to the hand mic. Okay. I can't move, man. Sorry, That's it. I need space, man. <laughs> Where was I? Yeah. The love of God, if you think about it, Jesus says that I am the author and the finisher of your faith. Now, if you think Jesus is a, is a slave master, then your faith will look like works. If you think that Jesus requests obedience immediately because that's the right thing to do. Your faith will look like works. And that's how you'll be tired out. That's how you'll be overwhelmed so easily because your faith has been based in something that's not him. But if you understand that Jesus is the perfect bridegroom, fully crazy in love with you, your faith is now resting in his love. Your faith now comes, your author and finisher of faith comes from an internal power, which is the love of God. It makes it easy. The moment I switch my thinking to go towards this type of thinking, I see the favor of God on my life. 
I see it. I'm like, oh my goodness, I didn't even recognize that. Like for instance, a small testimony. Yesterday, I, I think I ate off chicken, I don't know. <laughs> but I was as white as possibly can be, and I was stuck in bed, like the whole day. Couldn't move, was stuck in bed. And I went to bed very early. I think the first, last time was the first night in, I think, how, old, how long am I a mom now? Five years, almost six years, that I slept 12 hours. Okay, so if you're a mom, you don't sleep, just FYI. But anyway, so last night was the first night in six years that I actually slept 12 hours. I went to bed very early, and I woke up around about seven. And it brought so much rest. But his goodness in this situation was, I woke up healed this morning. I mean, yes, a 24-hour bug can only be a 24-hour bug. Yes, that's true. But by the grace of God, it is only a 24-hour bug. Understand, that's how powerful he is, that he can limit the impact of a virus on your body. Not because he's God and he wants to show himself off, but because he's in love. If you are in love with someone, you will, I see this with my husband, sometimes I'm like, whoa, calm down, calm down, sit down, puppy, sit, sit, sit. <laughs> if someone touches me, he will destroy you. That's the way it works. His love, his stoppers love towards me, the natural instinct is to protect me. That's his natural instinct. So if someone touches me, he will literally, he will, Hyrox is a bull, <laughs> red. And it's not because he's an angry person or because he, he struggles with violence. It's because he loves me. And that is exactly the same way that God works with us. When the COVID virus comes against you, he's not like, okay, you deserve it because you did this and this. And believe me, all of us think that. Somewhere along the line, we always think the circumstances I found myself in were somehow connected to what I've done. Even if it is, even if that is true, he is so good that he says, no, not guilty. You must get healed. There are so many people that walk around with acceptance in their bodies or acceptance in their lives. You know, that's just the way it is because I've done this and this. And we keep the condemnation on our shoulder, the accusation that keeps on saying, no, you're too, not too bad. We keep it there. But God's love is like, doesn't matter, doubt, not guilty. And he goes in and he protects he will always protect you. He will always guard you. He will always guide you. This is a jealous God, not because he wants worship. No, because he's in love. He's in love with his church. When I was a wedding photographer many, many, many moons ago, I know that it's, it's all beautiful when the bride walks down the aisle. Everyone looks at that. That's definitely beautiful. But to me, the most beautiful scene in a wedding was the groom. When he sees his bride for the first time. I could see in the groom's face when he sees his bride for the first time, whether he loves him, her or not. I can see it. Not, not, I'm a photographer, not in a relationship with that person. But a, a bridegroom that is in love with his bride, he's overwhelmed with emotions. He's overwhelmed with oh, this beautiful being walking towards me. She's becoming mine. And that's the way Jesus looks at us. He is honored. He is honored when you come into his presence. Yes, he is worthy of our praises, definitely, by all means. He's so good. I want to praise him every day because I'm like, wow, look at this that you gave me. But he is honored when you decide to enter his presence. That's how much value you carry as a person that's been created in his image. And you know what saddens me? We don't live accordingly. We live accordingly a worm mentality. Oh, I'm so sorry, Jesus. And we don't want to ask him. My three-year-old, I'm going to tell this story. I don't know if Stoffel told this story before. We're learning a lot of God's goodness through my three-year-old, my Carla. She is the queen the only queen, there will never be another queen. <laughs> That's her. <laughs> and um, because when President Ramaphosa closed our beaches, did I tell you guys this testimony before about my daughter? 
because he closed the beaches, we had to find a very quickly a different way to entertain our children. Now, David is very easy. You just take him to any place that has trucks, and he's happy. So Stoffel just went to the highway. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Walk next to the highway. Very easy. And there was a lot of helicopters, so that also kept him busy. But my daughter, she, I don't know. I don't know what she wants. Most, she wants makeup. And she once make up me that my whole face was black, my own makeup. My whole face was black. She loves that. She thinks that's a kitten look, but you're one big <laughs> black blotch. Anyway, so to keep her busy, the only th thing that I could do was to go to take her to the shops with me. Now, that's also a mistake, <laughs> but anyway. And as we walk into this mall, we were at Hartenbos and we went to the Langeberg Mall. Am I saying it correctly? This Langeborn and Langeberg, or Langeberg Mall. There were these little machines that you put the five rand coins in and they make, woo, you know, that's very irritating kitty machines. That's a plane or a train or whatever. They are loaded as you walk. All of them are standing next to the, um, next to the pathway, ready for any mother that's desperate. <laughs> just to put five rand. And Carla is obsessed. There's a little plane, this little princess one, she wants all of them. And I don't have five rand coins. So I keep on telling her, Nia, mama, it me help me. No, mommy doesn't have money. No, mommy doesn't have money, which I don't. I don't, I have money, but I don't have five rand coins. Eventually we go into the shop. She shops everything. As <laughs> she's loading in, I'm loading out. <laughs> And eventually, we leave the shop. So by now, I'm hoping that she forgot about these little things. And as we walk, she's like, oh, I want to go. My mother-in-law was with us. Oh, I want this. Mommy, mommy, I want to go this. Mommy, mommy, I want to go this. And eventually, I was like, the only way for her to learn now that the, I don't have money is to, to experience the consequences. So I said, okay. And I only had a 10 cents with me, like brain 10 cents. And I put it down on the machine and I give her the 10 cents, fully knowing there's no way that this machine will work with the 10 cents because they're clever like that. And she takes the 10 cents, very excited, and she puts it in. And as she slides in in the, in the top, two five rand coins get slided out on the bottom. <laughs> and the machine gave her money. Now that's what she believes. Machines must give her money. She, she loves the ATM. <laughs> And my daughter, in front of my eyes, are having a ball of a time. She's like five rand coin after five rand coin just riding. And I'm standing there and thinking, Jesus, you are not on my side. <laughs> and he's like, obviously, I'm on the side of favor. I'm on the side of blessing. And that's what it is. Do I need to explain to her how to handle the favor and the blessing? It will happen through fathering. But I don't have to be her message of of. No, this is what we must do. And we so easily do that with ourselves. God blesses us abundantly, and then we're like, oh, I must be a good steward. Must, 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 must. But he's a good father. And in the process of him just showering down with five rand coins, your heart is falling in love with him. And a heart that is yielded to God is the most beautiful heart. It is those hearts where he says to Noah, Build me an ark, the impossible that's never seen before. It's those hearts where he speaks with David, where he speaks to David and said, lead this army. It's that heart where he finds in Jesus that says, I will go to the cross. A heart that falls in love with God. But to see, the Bible teaches us that it, because he first loved us, we now love him. It's a love translation. It's a love transaction. It's a love transformation. What is about to enter the world is all about love. And not the hippie kind that doesn't have substance. The real kind that is the substance of God. We're going to see a wave of love coming down on us and transform us. And here's the thing. You have a choice. That's how much he loves you. Did you know that? God loves us so much that he gives us a choice. That you can stand and receive or you can walk away. Now me, I've learned the walking away part. And I've known, I've learned it firsthand. The walking away part, that's not fun. 
to walk out of his ways, out of his truth, that's not fun. To walk away from love, to make my heart cold towards him, that's not fun. But I've seen if I keep my heart yielded to his heart, I have an amazingly blessed life in the middle of a 24-hour bug. I have an amazingly blessed life because he is good. He is life. Last story, and then Stoffel's going to come up. We, sh- we are co- <coughs> <laughs> Oh, Stoffel. <laughs> Thank you, Lukey. Um, so the one morning, I'm just going to see if I read all my scriptures. Oh, I have an important thing to say also. But first, tell me the story. So the one morning, my daughter wakes up, and she has had, just before we left on holiday for December, I was just, something said to me, just take it to the doctor. Now, I don't, I don't want to be those moms that take my child to the doctor when a little pinky toe got hurt. But I felt the urgency to take it to the doctor. And we went, and she checked the ears, the doctor, and she's like, oh, there's so much pressure on Carla's ears that it's supposed to burst. But the child is not showing any signs of discomfort or any She's not, she's doing, she's Carla, twirling and being herself. But she had a level of pain that for a human, a grown-up person will just, we will not survive. We will be so, like, broken in that pain. And that somehow she could manage it. So we went on holiday with all the antibiotics to, to bring a solution to this year. And the one morning she wakes up and she's screaming. And then I realized, I said to Stoffel, if this child is screaming, then we passed pain. We pa- we're at a level of extreme pain. So we're running around. It's not our own town. We're trying to find a pediatrician in the middle of COVID. Now, that, that's fun. So eventually, I find this pediatrician, amazing man, and I make an appointment with my daughter, and she's sitting with me, but she's screaming. Like, Carla, she doesn't scream, but she is screaming. And the moment we stepped into the doctor's office, the baby before... He saw, before Carla, that he saw, he only wore a mask. But because we are not his regular patients, and because he doesn't know what's wrong of us, he transformed from a regular mask to a suit <laughs> for the next consultation. So now you can imagine my daughter screaming her lungs off, and this alien person with a white mask, white suit, standing in front of her, and she doesn't want to leave me in the doctor's all time. Don't step in that line. There was a line, and we were not allowed to step over the line. I'm, and she doesn't want to sit on the bed because she's scared of this person. And I, I'm like, this is chaos. How are you going to look into her ear? And she, he's almost commanding her to lie down. Now, you don't work with my daughter that way, but eventually she listens as I speak to her. And it's chaos. It's the worst meeting of my life. She's still screaming. The doctor keeps on telling me to put my mask over my nose. And it was just like, I'm like... This is not, this is just fear. In the middle of this fear, I hear God's voice. He said to me, release favor. I'm like, what? And he said to me, this man doesn't understand the peace of God, but you do. And that is what you carry, Linda, release favor. So I stood there in the middle of this chaos with my daughter screaming, and I release peace and favor. I'm like, Lord, your peace will reign in this place. And within minutes, my daughter stopped screaming. She's lying still. And this man, you can see, was almost relaxing. And then the Lord said to me an interesting thing. He said, thank you. It's going to stay there till the end. So I left my peace with this man. So that the next patient that comes in will experience the peace and not the trauma and fear that was ruling and reigning before that. But because I was in love with my father, and I know that he's a good God, when he said something like that to me, immediately I was like, that's the authority I carry. And that is the authority that we do all carry. When we are in love, we hear his voice. Because I hear Stoffel's voice any place. He has a loud voice, but I recognize his voice any place as my husband, because I'm in love with him. When you're in love, you recognize his voice very easily. And because of that, I could release a gift to this man who's facing a storm that the rest of the world, the rest of us who's not in the medical field will never understand. The last story I'm going to 
to read to you guys is in 1 Kings 19, and it's about the voice of God. Understanding that you are loved is also the foundation of hearing God's voice. That was my actual sermon, hearing God's voice. 1 Kings 19. How's that? So this is a story of um, Elijah and him escaping Jezebel. Now, right before, the reason why he is escaping Jezebel is because he destroyed all the prophets of Baal. Now, we all know that story very well. They called down fire, nothing happened on their offering or on their little wooden thing. And then Elijah said, okay, put some water on mine. And with one Lord, it became a zap down and fire was burning. And so, and he killed all the prophets of Baal. That's quite a hectic story, but that was the power that Elijah walked in. But he's running away from Jezebel, which to me is very strange. He just saw the beauty and the power of the God that is with him. But at the same time, all of a sudden, a woman says, I'm going to kill you the way that the prophets of my, the, the, my prophets look like, you're going to look like tomorrow. He starts running away from them. And we catch the story where eventually an angel feeds him, and I don't know, very interesting story. Go read it. Then in Elijah, 1 Kings 19, verse 11, then he said, go out, and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And and after the fire, a still, small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Now this is very interesting. Before this, whenever God moved and spoke, he spoke like the the sections before. The mountains, remember Moses, the mountains trembling, the earthquakes, the lightning, all those things. Before this, God spoke from the outside. He spoke outside. And then all of a sudden, why this whole piece of scripture was captured in the Bible, I believe, is all of a sudden Elijah had it, was transformed from the old covenant into the new. And Elijah heard the still small voice. You see, God is so faithful that he only has to use a still small voice. And that what was on the outside, you know, God had had to rule and reign from the outside. And the new covenant, it comes from the inside, the Holy Spirit. And we are the blessed ones because we have God in the inside. And he only has to whisper and we hear him. We don't have to see the trembling of the mountains. We think that is impressive. The real impressive thing is that he's inside of us. We so easily get impressed with all these angels. The real impressive thing is Jesus pitching up. And this is the same thing. Elijah, God loved Elijah so much. There was so much favor on, God, on Elijah's life that he gave him a glimpse of the new covenant, which is the still small voice. You see, Galatians see, say, you ha- it's for freedom's sake that you have been set free. Now stand. Us, new believers, you have been set free from freedom, for, from fear. You have been set free from the outside forces that's trying to control and manipulate your life. You have been set free from that. Now stand and allow the still small voice to be your guide. It says in Romans that how much the enemy has come in. The enemy has come in with the first Adam and did this and this and this and this and this and all these things. Romans goes into details. But then it says, how much more did we receive because of the Son of God. We are on the winning side. And today I have this urgency, and that's why I want to talk about this message. I have this urgency that we will start to recognize that God is in love with us. So much 
that he gave us our inheritance, who is the Holy Spirit. He is our inheritance. We have been made one with the God of the universe in the Holy Spirit. A perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was given so that we can become one, one, uno, in, with the Holy Spirit. You have the Spirit of God that lives inside of you and that walks with you daily. Nothing can come against you. And my, my tip, my key, my, my thing I want to leave to you, and this is a very basic message, is learn to receive the love of God and fall in love with Him, because then you'll hear the still small voice. Still can only whisper, and I hear Him. Actually, sometimes we think, and I hear Him. Can I tell them the story about Mozambique when I got lost in Mozambique? So we went with a, t um, a couple, in, this is many years ago, some of you have heard the story before. We went with a, cu a couple to Mozambique, and um, I've been, I love safari, I love 4 by 4 I love that, so I know a little bit about it. So I could see when we went into the country that our tires are not right, <laughs> that we are going to get stuck somewhere along the line. The problem with Mozambique is the southern side of Mozambique. When you go in, um, you enter a beach area. So there's lots of roads that take you to the destination where you have to go. And no one follows the same route. So the one person is this route, the other person is on that route. So when you do get stuck, you're stuck for days. That's the problem. So as we went in, we were there with another couple. It wasn't even 10 minutes, and we got stuck. So now we're on the... Mozambique inside, there's no service, internet service, so we can't use our phones. And I say to Stoffel, Stoffel, I know somewhere here must be a village or a lodge or something. So I'm, my, me and my friend, the other person's wife, we're just going to walk um, to the next lodge and going to find someone to send them back so that they can help you guys. So now Stoffel and the husband, he's they digging, and Stoffel says, okay, it's fine, you go. But he's so me. <laughs> because you know there's hippos. <laughs> so we walk, me and this wife, the wife, and we're having so much fun. We're singing, we're laughing, we're not realizing actually what we're walking into. You know? We're walking in a, um, a wild resort, so there's a lot of wild animals, and it's not safe for women to walk alone, you know? All those lies. And I'm walking, I'm walking, and eventually a lodge takes a group out on a quad bike, and they pass Stoffel and the guy who's stuck there, which is also the favor of God. And all of a sudden, I don't know, the husband recognized that his wife has, went, that his wife has walked into dangerous territory because this lodge said, where are your wives? And they're like, no, they've kept on walking. And when their faces were like, what did you guys do? You sent your wives into, into lion territory. <laughs> so the guy that was with Stoffel freaked out, which is a normal reaction for any husband, you know? He's freaking out. He's like, where's my wife? So he runs from the one hill to the other hill, and he screams her name, ah, and trying to get her to come back. We don't know about anything. But Stoffel, who is one with me, stands, and he says, Lord, is she fine? Is Linda okay? Hey? Is Linda okay? And he yes, yes, she's okay. She'll, you, I'll, you'll find her. And then he just keeps on going with his normal stuff. And it wasn't even five minutes later they found us and brought us back to Stoffel and the, the husband. But it showed me the favor and the guy that operated in love. Because he was lo in love with his father, he immediately could sense, this is, this is my father. He's also Linda's father. The two of us are one. I can feel because she, I'm one with her, I can feel she's safe. The father said she is safe. I can trust and he stayed in trust. And because of that, he experienced a way better day than the other guy. <laughs> and no lion killed us. <laughs> that is the beauty that we have. That is the spirit that we have. There are loads of things that the spirit is constantly depositing into your spirit. But because we don't lock our eyes, we miss it. It's little gifts that he's giving to us the whole time. But because we get so busy and sidetracked with all those things around us, we forget to listen, to stare into our bridegroom's eyes. 
So what I want to do now at ending is we're going to take communion. And the reason why we're going to take communion is because I believe that communion is the feast for the wedding. This is where we feast for the wedding. We have little tots and um, and I think the School of Intimacy is just going to hand each one of you. Stoffel is going to quickly explain what a communion is about, and then he's going to pray for us. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm just so excited for this morning, and there's just some things that the, the Lord has, has laid on my, on my heart. But firstly, just um, well done, my love. That was amazing. <laughs> Um, just to just to share with that story that Linda shared is, it was actually I I didn't even really speak to the Lord. I just knew that I'm I'm one with Linda and I'm connected to her um, spiritually. So I could immediately pick up in my spirit what's going on in her spirit, and I knew that she's okay, and because I, I knew that if she was not okay or anything or that she was in fear or anything like that, I would pick it up immediately. So, um, and I, we, I still, we, we still do that today, you know, because we're, we're one, the Lord has made us one. That's the privilege that we have with our spouses, is to be able to always know what's actually going on, but it's, it's in the spirit, it's in the spirit realm. Um, so, yeah, they, they're sending around the, the communion, and um, we obviously know that we start off with the bread, you know, like we start off with the, there's a little wafer there. You'll see in your communion pack, there's two lids. So the one is for your wafer, and then the second one is for um, your juice or the, the blood of Jesus. Um, but Paul clearly says that there's many of you who are sick, and there's many of you who die prematurely, because you do not recognize the body of Jesus. And obviously, the context of what he was talking there was communion. So, basically saying that the body of Jesus was broken for you. And the Bible says that by his stripes, you were healed. Not by your stripes, you're going to get healed. By his stripes, you were healed 2,000 years ago. So, Paul says that the body was broken for your healing. So he became sick so that you can become healthy. You know, that great exchange that, that happens. And I just feel like the Lord wants to go after physical healing this morning. I just feel like there's sicknesses and ailments that's in your body and it's illegitimate. It, it's not allowed to be there, okay? Because just what, G, what Linda spoke about now is that, that He is good. He is in love with you, and He wants you to be healthy. <laughs> he wants you to be healthy so much that He took all sickness upon Himself. He became sickness so that you can step into divine health. Okay, he, he took those stripes, he took those beatings on his body so that you can be healthy. Okay? And that's what the whole theme of this morning, we were talking just about, if he gave his son, the Bible says, if he gave you his son, how much more will he not give you everything else that you need? Everything else is referring to physical healing. <laughs> okay? Is that your body will be healthy. Now, how does this work is you've got authority over your body, okay? So, your body was made, the Bible says your body was made out of the dust of the earth, okay? Your body was made, your fleshly body was made out of the earth, out of the ground, and God said to Adam and Eve that I give you authority over the earth. Okay? So your body is part of the earth, so you've got authority 
over your physical body. Okay? You've got authority over it. So how does physical healing work? Is that you speak to your body. <laughs> you take authority over your physical body. And you command it. And I can, I can tell you many testimonies of people that started doing this. They just started speaking to their body. They started speaking to the areas where there's sickness, areas where there's something is not right. They started taking authority, and they started speaking to it, and they just kept on doing it. And they were radically healed. Radically healed by just doing that. So what we're going to start off is we're going to partake of the body of Jesus, so the physical body, so this is, the Bible says, this is the physical body of Jesus Christ, His flesh, and you partake of that, and that is your healing, okay? So you receive the healing that He's purchased for you 2,000 years ago. It's already done, okay? You can just receive it by faith. You just receive it. And how do you receive it? By eating, <laughs> okay? So we're going to eat that healing, and then we're going to take authority over your body. Okay, are you guys ready? Okay, so just by faith, say thank you, Lord, that this is your body that was broken for me. Thank you, Jesus, for healing that you've bought for me. I receive it now by faith. Okay, you can eat. Don't disengage your faith. It is healing that you're eating. You are physically eating healing right now. It's free. It's a gift from Him. Okay, so, as you sit there, I want you, you can do it softly, you can do it out loud, whatever you feel like. But I want you to now speak to your body. You know what's wrong. You know what's going on in your body. I want you to, f to speak. Take authority. You're not speaking to the Lord. You're speaking to your body. Okay? I want you to take authority over your body. You can lay hands on the area that you're speaking to if you want to. But speak to it. Take authority. Sickness is not from God. It is illegitimate. It's demonic. So command it to go. If, some, if something needs to get smaller, speak to it. If something needs to go, speak to it. Tell it to leave. If something needs to be restored, speak restoration over it. If, if your body is okay and there's someone else, just speak to that, speak to their body. But Lord, I'm coming in agreement with every single prayer that's being prayed right now. And Lord, I come in agreement and I speak to that body, I speak to that part, I speak to that organ. Lord, I speak to that muscle, I speak to that bone, and I command it to be healed in the name of Jesus. I command it to be healed. Lord, whatever needs to leave, I command it to leave in the name of Jesus. Whatever needs to be restored, I say be restored in the name of Jesus Christ. Any sickness, I command you to go in the name of Jesus. Leave. Go in the name of Jesus Christ. You are not welcome. You're not welcome in this body. We take authority over every disease, every sickness, every pain, everything that's not from Jesus. And I command it to go in the name of Jesus. I come in agreement with you. You are healed. You are healed. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. By faith. <laughs> by faith you are healed so I want to encourage you now act healed <laughs> okay. 
okay? <laughs> now act healed. Act on your faith. Act on your faith. James says, I show you my faith through my actions. <laughs> don't disengage your faith. Keep it in there. Keep it in there. Even if you don't see a manifestation, just even as the day goes on and tonight, just keep your faith activated. Just keep your faith activated. Keep on speaking to it and act yield. And you will see that the, the illusion of sickness disappears. <laughs> because the truth is that you are already healed. 2,000 years ago. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, so then we're going we're gonna to go to the blood. <laughs> And um, what we're going to go after now with the blood, so there's many things that we can do as we do communion, but what I really feel like when Linda, when Linda preached, that we're going to go after now is what the blood of Jesus has done is that it's given you a clean conscience. Okay? It's given you a clean conscience. What is your conscience? Well, a lot of people don't know what their conscience is. Your conscience is your heart. Okay? So, your heart and your conscience is, is, is the same thing. And the Bible says, is that, Peter says, all of us, whether we're Jew or whether we're Gentiles, our hearts have been purified through faith in Jesus Christ. Our hearts have been purified through His blood. And a lot of us are walking around with a lot of condemnation and shame and stuff that's there. And we think that holding on to that is godly. <laughs> but it's not. The godly thing to do is to receive the clean conscience that He has purchased for you at the cross, is to receive the purification of your heart. Your heart has already been purified through His blood. But to just, just as you've received healing for your body, you receive that purification of your heart and the purification of your conscience by faith. So I'm just going to give you a moment and just, just start thinking about this. What Lord, what are the things from my past that's still defiling my conscience, which is, which is illegitimate? What are those things from my past that I'm, there's a little bit of guilt still there? There's a little bit of thing of like, I still feel a little bit guilty about that. I still feel a little bit defiled, okay? Because if you, if that is in your, in your, in your, in your spirit, if that is like in your heart, the Bible says your heart is going to con condemn you and you're going to struggle to walk into intimacy with the Lord. But then the Bible goes on and says, but God is bigger than our hearts. He's bigger than your heart. He's bigger than that condemnation. And His blood cleanses you from all of that condemnation, from all of that guilt, from all of that stuff that you feel a little bit guilty about. Okay, so, we're going to partake of this blood, the blood of Jesus, that washes us clean. And then, we're going to allow Him to cleanse us completely in our conscience. So, let's partake of the blood. Thank you, Jesus, for that forgiveness. And let that forgiveness flow through you, through your, through your conscience, through your heart. And if there's, if there's anything, like I said, just, just quiet yourself. And if there's anything that you feel guilty about, just allow His blood to take that away. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you come and show people right now, in this moment, 
any area of condemnation. That you come and show them. You can ask them, Lord, if this, is there any area where I feel condemned about? Is there any area where I feel guilty about? You can ask him right now. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you reveal to, to us right now any of those areas. And thank you, Lord, that I just come in agreement now with your blood and your blood that speaks greater things. And what your blood is speaking is that your sins are forgiven. So I just declare over you right now that your sins are forgiven, that your shame is taken away, your guilt is taken away through the blood of Jesus. And I declare over you now that you've got a clean conscience squeaky clean, completely white, clean conscience because of the blood of Jesus. It is free. It is free. And just see His blood washing away all that guilt and all that shame, all that condemnation. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You are whiter than snow. <laughs> Your heart is purified. You are clean. And we thank you for that, Jesus. We worship you. And we honor you. We glorify you. I just got such a sense 